Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Aran Segel. Dr. Segel is a computational biologist and faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. The Segel Lab is multidisciplinary with research scientists focusing on the microbiome, nutrition, genetics, gene regulation, and more. The Segel Lab aims to develop personalized nutrition and personalized medicine using machine learning, computational biology, and more. Thank you so much for being with us today. So, so Ran, we, um, you and I have uh, some root in the Weizmann Institute of Science, and uh, I would like uh, to hear from you. How do you compare the Weizmann Institute of Science to other organizations that, uh, or other institute that you work uh, at uh, before? So I, I've been here 16 years, so, you know, I may not be the most objective person uh, in the world to, to answer this question, but I'll, so I'll give you my my subjective perspective is I think the Weizmann Institute is really a, it's an incredible top-notch place to do, to do science in. The unique thing here is that we don't have undergraduate studies and really the sole focus is, uh, is research. And the scientists are recruited not by an area of focus that we want to focus on as an institute, but actually by only by scientific excellence and scientists have the freedom to go after their curiosity and then work on whatever they want to work on, which I actually personally took a lot of advantage uh, of. I'm sitting in the, the Department of Computer Science, and uh, a few years, years after I joined, I opened a wet lab to do experimental biology, and then I did experiments in human to study human nutrition. And uh, I think it's, I'm not sure that in all computer science departments in, in the world, one would be able to to do that. So I think it's uh, very very unique and special. Obviously, there's many such many amazing places in the world, but I think Weizmann is definitely one of them. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> now, Ron, can you walk us through your background a little bit? How did your experiences lead you to computer science, and then ultimately to personalized nutrition and medicine? Yeah, so my parents, actually, when I was nine, although they're not, they have nothing to do with computers, they bought me a Commodore 64, which uh, maybe most people don't know, but it's a a personal computer with only 64K of memory. So probably one millionth of what you have in computers today. And I started programming when I was nine. I I really liked it. So I was in the area of of, of computers uh, since I was a, since I was a kid and really drawn to you know, the many things you can do with, with computers and the many, basically every domain you can, you can, you can touch upon. And then I did after the army where I didn't have any relationship to computers. I uh, did my undergraduate in computer science in Tel Aviv university, and then my uh, PhD in computer science at uh, Stanford university. And that's when I started to work with the expertise being machine learning and AI but applied to the area of computational biology and I've been in this field for 23 something years. Thank you for the answer, Ron. For, for a bit of a background for our listeners, we were planning to record this episode uh, around a month ago and then uh, we had to reschedule because you, you had to advise the Israeli government on COVID. And uh, as uh, I assume all of us know, Israel is a, a, a bit a leader or unique in uh, uh, treating and dealing with uh, COVID uh, comparing to other places uh, in the world. So uh, so can, can you tell us a bit about how a government like uh, Israel using scientists like you to help them uh, uh, predict and uh, treat better the population in Israel? 
Yeah, so I, I got in, into this completely by chance when I uh, came back from uh, my last visit to the U.S., which was right before, right in March of 2020, right before the, the lockdown here in Israel and I guess in many other places. And it was clear this is going to be a, a major thing. And many scientists at Weizmann got together and thought, you know, how could we contribute? We and my lab came up with the idea that because we didn't have a lot of testing there, the whole country of Israel was doing about... 1,000 tests a day. Now they're now we're doing close to 500,000 tests a day. And when you don't have testing, you have to find other means of knowing who's sick. So we came up with the idea of uh, using in the digital era using symptom surveys. So we, you know, we put a, we had the idea on Friday. On Saturday evening, we already had a Google form that we started distributing to the population, and uh, actually millions of people started uh, filling this out, and that gave us an idea with like in real time who has symptoms and in which regions, and it helped us to predict in advance where outbreaks are, are going to occur. So, so this is how kind of I got into it. And then kind of in, around the second wave, it was clear that in Israel and maybe, maybe other places in the world, it, it, more important than the confirmed cases was to know how you're going to do in terms of hospitalizations and what's going to be the burden on hospitals. And we really, the government really needed projections on that in order to know how to, how to manage the pandemic. So, so my lab got into that, basically applying our uh, machine learning tools using Ministry of Health data to give these project, pro, uh, projections. And then I got invited into, into the government, the cabinet to, to advise the prime minister and the the cabinet members as part of there were maybe three four different groups of, of advisors to get different perspectives and i've been there i guess for the past uh, two years between navigating you know, five different uh, waves it's been very very challenging but i hope we were able to 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 add some value and to to give projections that that, that worked out and and really helped uh, with major decisions here on whether or not restrictions should be enforced should be put in place or not what would happen if they were what would happen if they if they weren't put in place and and, and so on so so I, I and i think i could also see really with from wave to wave how how government members started more and more to believe the scientific way and to believe a data-driven approach to managing the pandemic. And from wave to wave, this became more evident. If you hear interviews of uh, ministers now in the fifth wave, they will talk about mathematical models that they've been using as part of their decision-making uh, process. And uh, I think that's, uh, that was nice to see the, the progress there. Yeah, so, so in, in my view, one uh, good outcome of COVID, there are a lot of bad outcome, is that uh, uh, the society and governments uh, appreciate science more and appreciate scientists more, and uh, everyone understand why science is so important. So I think that uh, definitely you played uh, a very important role in that, and uh, there are a lot of other scientists, of course, that done it. My question to you is, can you uh, predict what will be with COVID? Let's say we are looking at uh, six months or 12 months or two years ahead. What, 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 where do you see it going? Yeah, so so that's that that's where I think it leaves the realm of of, of just you know AI or machine learning predictions and and more on uh, I think it's it's more speculations because we can't predict so far in the future. I really hope that with this last wave of Omicron, where at least in Israel, I think in the U.S., similar numbers, uh, about half of the population here were infected, and that should really at least for some time go moving forward. That should give us some immunity as a population on top of vaccines, on top of med medications that we have, on top of uh, a lot of other tools like uh, massive testing that uh, we now have available. So I'm really hopeful, well, one, that maybe this will be the last wave, but we don't know that for sure. But if not, that when the ne next wave uh, arrives, that from wave to wave, you know, we're, we're, we'll be smarter in understanding and projecting what's going to happen with it and, uh, and and with all this arsenal of additional and new tools be able to tackle it better than we did last waves and and, and as much as possible not have to do uh, any major steps and restrictions and continue with regular life as much as possible and how a you know in your view has the COVID 19 pandemic of the virus itself its side effects maybe the impact that it's had on society as a whole? 
impacted health? And do you think that there will be like long lasting impacts on longevity as well? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's of course, uh, hard to say. I, 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 if I had to predict, I probably would say that there would be an, a health impact to, to all of this pandemic in terms of, we know that viral infections, well, that there's, there's research on long COVID now, which is, which is real. And uh, maybe it also happened with other viruses, but we knew less about it because we studied it less. There's exciting research that came out just, just these past several weeks on uh, infections by Epstein virus leading to probably leading to enhanced development of multiple sclerosis. Just to give one example, uh, probably by antibodies of a person against the virus also attacking some, some, some glial cells. So uh, I think that, uh, and, and it will also vary on a person by person basis for sure, like everything in medicine and everything in life is very highly personalized. But I think many people will suffer moving into, into the future from the infections and it'll be, there will be a lot of interesting research coming out of, of this and, and also probably treatment modalities that we may have to deal with in the coming years after this. Interesting. So I would like to switch gear and uh, move to, I think, my our favorite uh, subject, personalized nutrition. And uh, uh, the question is, the first question is, why uh, have you decided to work on uh, personalized nutrition at your lab and uh, what uh, your lab done before personalized nutrition? Hmm. So uh, I'll start with the end, but my lab was working on very basic research in the area of gene regulation. In the end, the tools that we've used there, which were combinations of experimental biology and uh, development of methods and, and machine learning applied to data, are the same tools that we're using now on population level cohorts with you know continuous glucose monitoring data and nutrition data and genetic data and microbiome data, but metabolomics data, but but the obviously the research area is very different. I got into this completely also by chance and from a personal perspective. I'm an amateur a marathon runner and I was looking into uh, achieving a personal goal of running a full marathon under three hours. And as, as I was reading on how to improve one's running ability, I was also reading on the nutrition that's around that. And I came across the literature and, and, and some, some books, a really a major book that had a influence on me was uh, good calories, bad calories by Gary Taubes, who really opened up uh, to me this whole idea that, uh, you know, maybe a lot of the nutritional changes that we've done as a society in the past several decades have really been influenced by commercial interests, by politics, not by science. I'm mainly talking about the decision to move from a high uh, fat diet to a high carb diet, especially with a lot of processed foods. And as I was reading about that, I realized that most of uh, what I was reading in terms of nutrition for sports, but also nutrition in general, is probably really not based on science. And it, it really blew my mind. I remember I, I read his book on a flight to Australia, and then I decided to start experimenting on, on myself. And I was uh, shocked by, by a, lot of the, a lot of the findings. And then I took uh, initially just one graduate student and I told him, you know, you have your main project, uh, that's a safe project in gene regulation, but let's start to explore some, some other area. And he, he was willing to, to go along and that small project turned into basically shifted eventually all of my research interests in the lab, just because we saw a major opportunity to again, use data and a data-driven approach to nutrition, which I think was not really pursued then on the scale that we did before. So it was a major, major opportunity. And, and, and yeah, that happened about 12 years ago. And since then. I've been working in this area and in the broader area of uh, personalized medicine. We know that you've done a lot of published, a lot of papers on obviously the importance of personalized nutrition and health, but what is the relationship or relationships maybe between personalized nutrition and longevity in general? So I would say that nutrition in general is probably one of the most important things in, in our life. If you think about the, it's the one thing that the only thing that uh, we, we put in our body to fuel our body every day and to, to, to enrich it and empower it. 
So it's a, it's a major driver of, of, of our health and, and life and uh, whether or not we develop disease and, and it's probably a major way to, to treat symptoms. And so it also definitely affects our, our health and well-being during, during our life and therefore also our, our longevity. Basically, by, you know, just think of it as the, in the most uh, simple way, if you, you know, if you run a car and you have uh, clean or, 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 or uh, dirty fuel, obviously, you know, if you put dirty fuel in, into your car, that'll, that'll cause damage and uh, it'll break down faster. I'll, I'll just add to that, that in addition to just talking about the role of, of, of nutrition, I'll say that what we also discovered is that, that then the second uh, layer is, is that it's not just the putting general fuel into your car, but really every car needs a different uh, type of fuel because we, we all have a very different uh, makeup in terms of everything, genetics and microbiome and our life experiences. And, and this is what the data showed us. It's not... It's not our, our hypothesis, but as soon as we started measuring people, we really saw that people respond differently. And so even without, forget about our own approach and solution, but just the data shows you that you put the same fuel into different people and you get different responses. The data shows you that you need a different approach to each person. That's very interesting. Uh, Iran, you are a computational biologist and uh, definitely you are looking at the big databases and uh, extract uh, interesting uh, outcome from them. So how do you think a, a big database of uh, free range humans, uh, companies like Insta Tracker and other that have uh, a lot of data of, uh, let's say, healthy human and not a sick population, uh, can play a role in uh, personalized nutrition? I, I think uh, such efforts and such uh, companies, I mean, these efforts, whether they happen in, in academia or, or in companies, I think, I think they, they have, they play a major role because, because in the end, there's, I think, no such thing as a healthy person. We're, we're all different. There's variation between people on, on, on all levels. And so in my view, and this is the approach we're also pursuing, you really have to measure uh, a lot of data and you measure a lot of outcomes. Um, these outcomes don't have to be disease versus not. It's actually, it could actually be much more interesting to study the subclinical range before you intervene with the treatments and medications and, and, and chemistry and so on to, to look at what happens to, what's the variation that you see in people naturally. And I really believe that if you measure enough data, enough parameters for enough time, you'll be able to, to get a lot of insights into what is underlying that uh, variation in people and how the different inputs combined with the makeup of a person lead to certain outcomes. So I think such data is really going to be uh, incredibly valuable for deciphering all of these different questions. Awesome. And we're going to pivot, I think, to something that you know very much about, continuous glucose monitoring. Could you give our listeners a bit of a background on what CGM is and how you can use them to predict the height of post-meal glucose levels? Absolutely. So when we started the research on personalized nutrition, I think one of the major questions was, okay, you want to study nutrition, but what, what, what's the outcome that you measure? And everybody was looking and is looking at, at weight. We, we all want to affect weight in the end. But if you, when we thought about it, we thought weight is not a really good outcome to look at because it takes a long time to change robustly. And it's when you, when you look at a person, say, today and three, four weeks or a few months moving forward, the change in weight is going to be affected by many, many, many different things. And that will be very hard to then troubleshoot back and understand what about the nutrition of the person was related to, to his change in weight. And it'll be almost impossible to relate that to the effect of individual meals, just because what you'll measure is the, is, is the compounded effect of, of all the meals that somebody ate during those weeks and not just the meals, but the exercise and sleep and, and so on and so forth. So we looked, uh, we searched for something that would be relevant to measure after each meal and, and we we ran into this research that was done on measuring glucose levels right after you eat a meal. 
what's called the uh, post-meal glucose response or technically the post-brandial glucose response. And uh, one of the technologies to, to measure that are these devices of, of continuous glucose monitors, which when we started the research were beginning to be developed by companies because of diabe- di- the whole pandemic of, uh, epidemic of, of diabetes. And these devices, basically, they, uh, you, you, you put them on, on your body, they, they attach with a very small needle which measures glucose levels, not in the blood stream, but actually measures it in interstitial fluid. And what these uh, companies developing the devices showed is that these glucose measures from interstitial fluid are actually very correlated to the actual glucose levels in the blood. And these devices, they measure the glucose levels every five minutes and, and they record it. And so if you put one of these sensors on a person for a week or two, you, you'll get a trace of the glucose levels continuously measured every every five minutes. So for us, this was incredible data because one could look at, at somebody eating a meal. And when somebody eats a meal, the carbohydrates in the meal get digested by, by a person and, 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 and then thrown into, into the bloodstream. And there we can measure it with these uh, CGM devices. And the whole event of the blood glucose levels going up and down after a meal occurs within a window of about two hours in, in healthy people. And so you can get a single quantitative measure for how you respond to a single meal by using these uh, CGM devices. And so by putting them on a thousand people for, uh, for a week, we could measure uh, blood glucose responses to 50,000 meals. And that gave us a, a really unique and unprecedented data set to couple blood glucose responses in 1,000 people to what they actually ate and to have a data set to see the variation between people and to be able to develop algorithms that from the meal data and from personal information about people predict what would be the blood glucose response of, of an individual. And I believe we were one of the first to really apply it to apply the CGM data to healthy people as opposed to only using them on uh, diabetics, which they were tailored for. And and that gave us a lot of, really a lot of insight on personalized nutrition and responses of people and a lot of, a lot of surprises, a lot of foods that uh, you would think uh, would cause huge spikes in glucose levels, which we found not to, and, and, and vice versa, foods that are considered, you know, healthy that really spike some people's uh, blood sugar levels and probably are not healthy for them and actually cause them to to gain weight. Incredibly interesting. I know we're digging more into that paper in particular, the 2015 one soon. I also wanted to ask about how the microbiome contributes to an individual's glucose response, as that's an area that you've also done a lot of research in. Yeah, so so I I think a very exciting area of research is the whole field of, of the microbiome, which is a relatively young field, maybe 15 years by now, we started working in this field 10 or 12 years ago. And, and uh, we, we knew that we have microbes uh, living with us. We, we knew that for uh, maybe 150 years, but only with uh, recent advances in, in technology were we finally able to actually measure what these microbes are with DNA sequencing, because a lot of these microbes, it's, they're very hard to culture outside of the body. They're, they're anaerobic. They, they don't grow with oxygen. So growing them is, is a challenge. We're getting better at that uh, now, but, uh, with uh, DNA sequencing, we can take a sample from somebody. We, we study, and most of the world is still focusing on the bacteria within our uh, digestive system, uh, within our gastrointestinal tract. So we look at uh, bacteria in the gut, although bacteria are uh, everywhere in our body that has uh, contact and uh, surface with the outside world. And with sequencing, we can finally characterize what these bacteria are. And when we did, we as a community, we found that we actually have an equal number of bacterial cells in our body as we do human cells. But if you look at uh, diversity of genes, we only have about 25,000 human genes, but we have millions of bacterial genes uh, that we each carry uh, with us. Most of these genes to, to date, we still don't understand what they do, but we know that they're very, very diverse. They can digest pretty much anything. And most of the foods, many foods that we eat and don't digest like uh, complex uh, polysaccharides or uh, a lot of plant foods and and so on, 
they they just go through our digestive tract and uh, they meet these thousands of bacteria who can digest them and, and give us energy from them or it can also shape up your uh, gut bacteria so they're really very heavily involved in our in 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 pretty much everything they they produce thousands if not tens of thousands of small molecules uh, that we've shown uh, recently many of which actually reach our bloodstream and circulation and even uh, some of them even reach our brain and so and so we can imagine and there are studies coming out that our gut bacteria can even affect not just our metabolism but even even brain functions and and, and even uh, some people even even say about you know your your mood and and and, and have really major effects which which we can understand on a from a biochemical perspective just because of all of these thousands of molecules that they produce that that circulate in our bloodstream so they're really uh, important I would say for probably most of our most of our functions and they have a role in, in our well-being and, and health and disease a lot of it are, are probably good roles obviously but when this when, when, when your gut bacteria population is imbalanced or when you have some bacteria, Uh, that are less wanted that that could also lead to development of, of disease so they're involved in our glucose response to food but then also in many many other uh, processes so so had one one study that you have done and it was really exciting for me is a, a study of the effect of a probiotic on a post antibiotic reculturing of the bacteria in the gut or the good bacteria or the bad bacteria can you please uh, discuss that Yes, so uh, we did two major studies on uh, probiotics. Uh, the first one, we asked uh, what happens when healthy people take uh, those probiotics that are on the market. And uh, quite surprisingly, we found that if you take a healthy person who has a um, rich gut ecosystem, you give them those bacteria, probiotics and, and bacteria in the probiotics. And, and many of them, they, they go out as they go in and, and probably have uh, no effect except to Make the company selling the probiotics more more rich what we did find is is in another study when we actually wiped out some of the population of bacteria by giving healthy people antibiotics we found that that in those situations when you give probiotics to people they they actually can colonize the gut they actually do colonize the gut because you've cleared the niche from a lot of the commensal residential bacteria but the surprise that we found which is what you referred to before is that when you do that it actually takes a longer time uh, for somebody to recover his original healthy uh, microbiome uh, because now the probiotics that colonize are actually interfering with the regrowth of the original bacteria of, of people and this was a surprising finding that was was unexpected because a lot of the doctors who Uh, would actually prescribe antiprobiotics together with antibiotics and presumably to to restore uh, your your vet bacteria but we actually found that it's the opposite that this uh, these probiotics are actually interfering after antibiotics with the restoration of your uh, gut bacteria to normal very interesting so so uh, I, I looked at your uh, publication and you published many many papers about uh, personalized nutrition a microbiome a, a glucose response so uh, I know that it won't be easy but can you try to summarize for uh, someone that uh, want to have a cliff note of uh, everything that uh, uh, Iran Segal's lab <laughs> learned about the uh, personalized nutrition in the last uh, let's say 10 years what will be the top uh, few you uh, uh, Um, in a uh, point of information that they uh, think that they should know yeah so let, let me try to do that briefly I, w- I would say that I mean I, I would say we learned three major major things I think the first one is that it really people have very different blood glucose response to food and, and I would even generalize that to say that food affects different people in different ways because it's, it's for sure not going to be confined to Just uh, to glucose and, and this is really just what the what the raw data shows uh, we, we, we measured it for the first time and and so we saw that that people have different responses and I think the 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 conclusion from that is that you have to tailor the diet so there's no there's not going to be a one-size 
uh, a fits all diet for everybody. That's conclusion number one. And the, the second, I would say, major takeaway is that when you go about measuring the right data, you could actually come a long way, maybe not perfectly, but come a long way into understanding how you can develop an algorithm to predict, to understand what are the factors in people that are uh, at least correlative to these different responses. And you could then, you could then develop an algorithm that basically could, given, given the input of a person and a meal, predict how that person is going to respond to that meal. So in other words, the, the second take home message is that with the right data, you can also understand some of the correlates to these differences and come up with a methodology to understand how to do that tailoring of a diet to a person. And the third major take home that I would say, which is now based on uh, a lot of clinical trials that we completed on uh, half a year and one year studies on people with prediabetes and people with type two diabetes and people with breast cancer, that when you actually take this approach and somebody and you implement it, this personalized nutrition approach, you can really improve one's health and clinical outcomes. You could really uh, by a dietary change, we've seen this many, many times, you could get off of medications that you're taking for type 2 diabetes. You can take get, get off of uh, blood pressure medications. You can lower your weight. You can improve your, your glucose w without medication. In fact, like I said, even sometimes with taking away those uh, medications. So, you know, the summary is basically people are different. With the right data, we can, we can come up with approaches to tailor to these differences. And if you follow these with these approaches, uh, you can improve one's, one's health. We've shown that in uh, clinical trials. Yeah, and, uh, and to emphasize that for our uh, viewer and listener, I've seen a, a, a few uh, slides in uh, some of your presentation, and it's uh, amazing to see that uh, basically lifestyle change your nutrition can give a better outcome than taking a drug so that's something that uh, everyone right. is today running for okay let's take the drug let's take this drug uh, and the pill is much easier but uh, the hardest way change your nutrition at the end of the day can give you a much better uh, uh, outcomes and, and and that's amazing and it's uh, really really exciting for me to 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 see it and to to see what you, what you have done Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say, I think, you know, if you think about it um, from a broader perspective, there's there's really not a lot of incentives to, as, as a, you know, as a, a community to develop these type of approaches to, I mean, there, there's, you know, there's no money in, in nutritional advice, right, compared to drug companies that, you know, the, the chronic disease for pharma companies is, is a, is something they they make a lot of money off and, and i think a lot of the focus is on diseased people and how do we treat them which is uh, important we, we have disease we, we have many people with disease we have to learn how to treat them but i think much less focus definitely orders of magnitude less focus is on the whole prevention because i really think that like you said without medication with just lifestyle changes you could really avoid all of those. I think you can treat a lot of these conditions, but you can avoid them altogether. Uh, and you can and you can track with data, uh, including the data that that you're collecting in Insight Tracker. You can you can track the trajectory of where people are are going, and you can catch them. And with lifestyle changes, I believe you could uh, you could move them to a different path. I think a lot of the times, and, 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 some, and you can do that better with, with personalized treatments to, to people, which again, based on data, I think we now have the opportunity to, to be able to do. And looking into the future, kind of at your current projects and things that you're working on, can you describe what Project 10K is and what you're hoping to accomplish with it? Sure. So in... in Project 10K, or when, when we finished, or we, we were never finishing, but when we progressed with all this work on personalized nutrition, we, we thought of, we could come up with a, with, with a much broader vision of not just looking at nutrition and not just focusing on the microbiome, but really take a more holistic view of, of a person. And really with all the 
I would say, combination of uh, instrumentation to profile one's physical and clinical status on the one hand, and with uh, deep multi-omic uh, genomic types of approaches to profile one's molecular makeup, microbiome is one component, but then we have human genetics, we have the thousands of molecules uh, circulating in our bloodstream, what's called metabolomics. We have uh, proteomics, which is to look at the makeup of our proteins that, that are in circulation. And we have uh, profiling of the immune system. We, we have many genomic approaches that have uh, emerged in the past uh, decade or so. And so we thought of the combination of all of that and, and what Project 10K is about. It's about taking a group of 10,000 people, which hopefully will even surpass and and bring them to the Weizmann Institute, to, to the lab, and, and profile them uh, very broadly with all of these different technologies that, that I just mentioned, and follow their clinical status and, and learn not just about glucose response to food, but learn about all of the different health conditions, all of the different profilings that we can do to people when we take a DEXA machine, for example, and we uh, look at fat distribution in the body and bone density uh, in the body. What correlates do we find between that and all the molecular data that, that we're, we're finding. And, and our hope uh, and goals in this project are to be able to much better characterize trajectories, clinical trajectories of people uh, a long time and be able to uh, predict uh, these trajectories, predict diseases before they occur, and also not just find biomarkers for them, but also find causal biomarkers that may lead to uh, new therapeutic uh, modalities. So, so that's the main focus of what we are working on these days. So I think that uh, around this uh, project might also allow us to understand a bit the process of uh, aging or longevity, because you are going to look at them for a very long t uh, term. So uh, my next question, and uh, you don't have to answer because uh, this podcast is longevity by design. So we are trying to dream about the future and the longevity. So I wanted to ask you, and again, you don't have to answer, what in your opinion will be the max and average uh, lifespan and health span in our lifetime? Hmm. Meaning how long can we live? Hmm. Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I, I don't think I have, I have an, an intelligent answer to, to give you on that in an in a intelligent prediction, but, but, it, but definitely I, I think I can say two things for sure, which is I think we can definitely live a healthier life during our even current lifespan. And I'm also certain that we can extend the current uh, lifespan that we have with, with a healthy lifespan. And I think that these type of data-driven approaches and, and data collections that, that you and us and others in the world are pursuing, I think those are going to be going to hold a lot of, a lot of the, the answers to that. And our, our wrap-up question for all of our guests is there's one decision that you make each day based on nutrition or health or longevity that you would be willing to share as a tip for our listeners? Hmm. So again, here I would say this is very personal. So, and, and, and actually the data shows us that it should be personal. So I don't think you should take my advice as a rule that would work for everybody, but I Actually, because that'll go against everything we talked about uh, here, but I would say I find it for me personally um, very good to actually skip. Uh, nor usually I skip uh, breakfast, and uh, and I confine my window of uh, of eating from about lunchtime to to evening time, and not not uh, too late. And I try to, in general, not religiously, because I think you have to find the right balance between living healthy, but also enjoying life. And I think the enjoyment in life is part of being healthy. So you don't have to be fanatic about it, but in general, I try to eat uh, the foods that I found uh, that are right for me. And I think this combination actually usually makes me feel good and energetic and even be able to do quite extensive sports in the morning time, but not require, not feeling hungry afterwards and starting to eat around lunchtime. But this is, what personal for me. <laughs> awesome. Good reminder. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. And thank you so much for being with us today. Sure. It's been a pleasure. And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientist. For more info, please go to www.insidetracker.com slash podcast. 
Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.